I believe that the entire phenomenon of globalization is now coming to an end. Either it moves towards a more progressive economic policy for which, again, you'll have to see class struggles, or alternatively, to prevent that from happening, a globalization would increasingly be defended at the political level through a turn towards authoritarianism, fascism, and suppression of democracy. What's happening in our country is, in fact, the latter. Uh, namely, that it is moving in an authoritarian direction. But in many countries of the world, globalization is being challenged in the context of this pandemic uh, by instituting policies which are not really acceptable within the framework of globalization. Let me try and explain what I have in mind. When one talks about globalization, the most important aspect of contemporary globalization is in fact the globalization of finance. That it is not just that productive capital is now mobile, that it actually goes, let's say American companies go and set up plants in China or in Vietnam or in Indonesia, Malaysia and so on, that of course. But additionally, even more important than that is that huge amounts of finance, which doesn't set up any plants, which is just funds being shifted from one country to another, is now globally mobile and enormous amounts of it are actually moving around across country borders. As a matter of fact, if you look at the cross-border movements of finance and compare it to the cross-border movements of funds which are requiring for settling trade, trade related, some country has a deficit, it has to pay money, some country has a surplus, then it actually, I mean, trade surplus, so it gives a loan to some other country. So if you look at trade related financial transactions, they are less than 2% of the total cross border financial transactions, which means 50 times as much of financial transactions are taking place, which are not related to trade, which are just autonomous movements of finance across borders. That is why we talk of the globalization of finance. That finance has become globalized. Finance capital is now globalized. Now, if you have globalized finance capital, but you actually have a nation state, that means you have a government which represents a particular country. You have the Indian state, you have the Pakistan state, you have the Polish state, you have the British state or the American state and so on. Then you have globalized finance facing a nation state. It has very profound implications. If the country is caught in these financial movements, then suppose the government of that particular nation state adopts some policies which are not liked by finance. In that case, finance would leave that country in large volumes. Now, if finance leaves that country in large volumes, suddenly that country would face an enormous crisis. It will face a financial crisis. Therefore, everywhere, whether they like it or not, governments are everywhere pursuing policies which are acceptable to finance. Therefore, you have not just that globalization is a globalization of finance, but because globalized finance is facing a nation state, you actually have the hegemony of globalized finance in the current epoch. And this is what globalization, what we call globalization, has actually entailed. The kind of policies which are liked by finance, which all governments are more or less forced to pursue, whether they like it or not, are what we call the neoliberal policies. So the neoliberal policies of the period of globalization are actually policies pursued at the behest of globalized finance by governments of the various nation states. Now the point is that, suppose you know, this is very important implications of democracy. Suppose it is the case that today you have government of party A, Tomorrow, suppose party A gets defeated and party B comes to power, unless that party B 
moves out of this movement of globalized finance by imposing capital controls, by imposing controls on financial flows, then you'd find that country B also would be pursuing exactly the same policies that country A was pursuing, as the, that government A was pursuing. In other words, you may have change of governments, but you don't have change of economic policies. Look at India. We have had the Congress government, we had the United Front government, we had the uh, Atal Bihari Vajpayee government, and again we had a Congress government, and again we have had uh, a now a BJP government. They all pursued the same neoliberal policies. Why is that? That's because of the fact that uh, they are all representatives of nation states, which is now facing globalized finance. Now, the, this has further economic implications. Let's just look at some of the economic implications. You know, in every country, say our own country, there's a huge reserve army of labor, of unemployed, underemployed, semi-employed people, and because of which the wage rate is more or less kept tied to a kind of subsistence level. But on the other hand, and this is true even of organized workers, they can't just have their wages rising because they are also subject to competition from this enormous labor reserve, this enormous amount of the reserve army of labor, which Marx had talked about. Therefore, wages are more or less at a certain subsistence level. Labor productivity rises. When labor productivity rises and wages remain at a subsistence level, then the surplus, surplus of output over wages rises. Therefore, the share of surplus, which basically is the share of property income, capitalist profits, incomes of all kinds of hangers on, incomes of all kinds of unproductive sectors like um, advertising and so on, all these, the share of these is rising. Therefore, you find that the increase in the share of surplus is associated with an enormous increase in income inequality and also in wealth inequality. I'll give you just one figure. If you look at income inequality in the sense of what is the proportion of the top 1% of the population in the total national income. Now, two French economists, Chassal and Piketty, they actually made an estimate for India. They have a big project, they make estimates for all kinds of countries, so they also made an estimate for India. That estimate said, and they use income tax data. In India, income tax was introduced in 1922. What they find is that Ever since 1922, the share of the top 1% of the population in the total national income has never been as high as it is today. In fact, it had come down after independence until the early 80s. It was only about 6% at that time, top 1% having 6% of the total national income. Today, it is about 22%, which is higher than at any time since income tax was introduced. So there's a dramatic increase in income inequality, which again is a phenomenon which is associated with this particular period. Now, you may say that yes, if income inequalities are rising because of economic processes, why can't the government tax away the surplus income and give it as transfers to poor people, transfers to the working people. This is where, again, we come up against the role of the hegemony of finance, namely that suppose some government taxes the rich people, then taxing the rich people would immediately frighten finance and they would leave the country. Therefore, the governments are in no position to impose taxes to take away this growing surplus and to distribute it among the poor, among the working people. Therefore, the income inequality is not only pre-tax inequality that is rising, but post-tax inequality that is also rising. When you have a rise in income inequality, then you find that this has a remarkable effect as far as the overall demand is concerned. I'm not yet talking on the pandemic. I'm talking on the situation before that. What you find that suppose you take a rupee, 
from a poor man and give it to a rich man. The poor man would be consuming that entire rupee. But you give it to a rich man, the rich man may consume 50 paise out of it, 50 paise or whatever, 40 paise, and put the rest in his pocket. Therefore, the such a transfer, a growth in inequality of incomes, is something which actually tends to have a consumption suppressing effect on the economy. And therefore, this has a demand suppressing effect on the economy. Demand tends to fall because of the fact that this shift takes place in income distribution away from the poor towards the rich. And this then gives rise to a crisis, a tendency towards a crisis. This tendency was kept in check earlier because of various housing bubble, dot com bubble in the United States. These are basically speculative bubbles that generated artificial demand. But with the collapse of these bubbles now, the crisis has been with us for quite some time. When you are faced with a crisis, the government can in fact spend in order to boost demand. But this is where come, we come to another aspect of the hegemony of finance, and that is that the government, for the government to spend, suppose the government spends 100 rupees. If it spends 100 rupees by taxing poor people, there's no, no net addition to demand because they were spending the 100 rupees buying consumption goods. The government takes away those 100 rupees. Their consumption falls as the government's consumption increases. No net increase in demand. Net increase in demand would arise either if the government doesn't tax anybody or alt and, and simply spends, which is called a fiscal deficit. It just borrows and spends. Or alternatively, if the government taxes the rich people, because if the government spends 100 rupees and taxes these 100 rupees away from rich people, they would have, let's say, spent 50 rupees out of it. Part of it comes out of their consumption. Part of it comes out of their savings. And as a result, there is a net increase as far as demand is concerned. Consumption has fallen by 50 of those people. It has increased by 100 of the government. And consequently, you have a net increase in demand. Therefore, the government could intervene. In fact, after the Second World War, the government did intervene in many different ways in order to boost demand. That's why capitalism had a long period of boom, which some people call the golden age of capitalism. For ever since the war, let's say approximately from 1951, right until the end of the 1960s, the early 70s, capitalism had a prolonged boom, the like of which it had never had before. And that's because the government, in fact, propped up the level of demand by ensuring that it was spending either by borrowing or by taxing the rich people. And of course, income inequality was kept in check. Now, if you have hegemony of finance, then this is out because you can't tax rich people, then finance would flow out. And even government expenditure by borrowing, which is what we call fiscal deficit, is something which finance capital does not like. Which is why all countries of the world, with the exception of the United States, actually have legislation saying that fiscal deficit cannot be more than a certain percentage of the income. All over the European community, it is 3% of, of, of GDP. In India, for the central government, is 3%. The state government is 3%. But if you, you cannot spend more than that, because if you do that, then finance would leave the country. State government certainly cannot. Central government may spend a little bit more or more than that. But on the other hand, it is terrified that it must not increase the fiscal deficit. So governments cannot intervene to get rid of the crisis, as used to be the case in the old days. Therefore, this entire period of globalization has been one in which not only has finance been globally mobile, not only has it been hegemonic, but what is more, the interest of finance and the interest of the people are very clearly at loggerheads. The, there's a contradiction between the interests of finance on the one hand and the interests of the people on the other hand. And this is something which was becoming more and more apparent. 
in the earlier period of globalization they did this conflict was camouflaged because it was said oh you know we are having such high growth rates that really the people's interest would get solved automatically this in their interest would be served by these high growth rates eventually they'll get jobs and so on now high growth rates never created jobs for them but let's leave that aside but now high growth rate also is not taking place as i mentioned the world economy has been in a period of crisis as you know in india long before the pandemic unemployment rate was higher than at any time in the last 45 years consumption is now as far as the ordinary people are concerned rural consumption per capita has fallen by 8% in 2017-18 compared to 2011-12 so much so that the government has actually suppressed that figure this what i'm telling you about the fall in rural consumption is what newspapers reported because this report of the national sample survey got leaked out now therefore before the pandemic struck in any case the fundamental contradiction between the interests of the people and the interest of globalized finance was becoming apparent people would like the government to intervene in order to increase employment but finance would not like the fiscal deficit to rise and therefore the government could not uh, implement any policy that could increase um, employment similarly people would like welfare state measures but the government cannot tax the capitalists it cannot increase the fiscal deficit therefore how can it finance welfare state measures that can benefit the people likewise when you look at uh, pri privatization of essential services education healthcare and so on all this is again demanded by finance capital it doesn't want the government to provide free or cheap healthcare to everybody it would like all these sectors to be privatized which is what has been happening in country after country during the period of globalization now this contradiction this fundamental contradiction between the interests of the people and the interests of globalized finance people in any country in every country this is a fundamental contradiction of our time of our epoch this contradiction has now come to a head because of the pandemic in the pandemic it is very clear that the reason why the pandemic has at all you know i mean governments everywhere had run down the public health system and consequently now you suddenly find that so many people are affected by the pandemic you have to make some arrangements for them government's healthcare system is not enough so you have to do something if they go to private healthcare system it requires so much money they don't have that money therefore the pandemic has brought to the fore the conflict of interest between globalized finance on the one hand and the people on the other for instance look at our own country what has happened the government ordered a lockdown that lockdown was ordered at 4 hours notice now with that lockdown enormous numbers of migrant workers found themselves without a roof on their heads without any food without any cash and wanted to just go back home to their villages there was no transport so they started walking or they started cycling or whatever now in this process everybody demanded that the government should come forward and give them some help give them some kind of you know uh, food some kind of cash uh, but on the other hand the government has not done anything its package of relief which it offered on the 24th the pandemic the, the the lockdown was announced this package of relief was actually announced a couple of days afterwards in that package of relief all kinds of earlier programs were repackaged and sold to the public as if they are new but as a matter of fact they were old programs when you look at fresh expenditure the total fresh expenditure was only 92000 crores which is less than half a percent of our gdp even when the lockdown got extended and extended still further now we are in the third extension of the lockdown there was no additional measure so the government of india has not spent 
anything other than what you may call peanuts, 0.5% of the GDP in providing aid or help to the working people who are really suffering enormously. Now, because of this, why is the government not doing this? Okay, the government, this government is very right wing. It has no sympathy for the people and so on. But additionally, there is an additional factor, namely it is hamstrung by being tied to globalized finance, by the economy being tied to globalized finance. If the government spends any more, it will have to do so by borrowing. Fiscal deficit would rise. And if that happens, then you would find there would be a financial outcome.